Good evening, everyone. We welcome you to this, our second night of a Leadership Discipleship Marathon. And we are delighted that you have joined us. If you uh, have friends, family that you can call or text, just why don't you invite them to join us for our show? We're going to be talking about building a, a culture of character among those that we are discipling. And so I, I trust that you will ask others to join you and be a part of our show tonight. We're going to be here all week. We're going to be here tomorrow night. We're going to be talking about what leadership is and what leadership is not. We're going to be talking Thursday and Friday about what leaders do and how that uh, intersects with mobilizing uh, the Christian community, with church planting, with uh, more discipleship movements. And so I trust that you will join. If you are a leader, uh, and you, you're recognized as that. We particularly want you to pay close attention, but this is really for everybody. It's hard to say always who's going to be the standout leader. Sometimes I've been surprised that people who didn't necessarily show a lot of uh, demonstrative leadership gifts turned out to be great leaders. And so uh, it, really this is for everybody. You may say, but you know, look, I, I'm just in the home all the time. Wow, you talk about... <clears throat> the importance of leadership and discipling. If you have children in the home, young children in the home, you are everything that we're talking about. And so I, I trust that you'll stay tuned and that you will invite others to join us. Well, we have a wonderful panel of guests tonight and I'm delighted to be working with them. And uh, so first of all, I wanna rep, uh, introduce Reverend Doug Conley. Doug, uh, has been a pastor for a number of years. He's authored a number of books, and particularly on in areas of discipleship and building up new believers in the faith. Uh, Doug, it's great to have you tonight, and uh, I'm anxious to hear some of what you have to say for our leaders about building this whole culture of character and uh, what it means for your followers, but welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here, and I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thanks, Doug. Uh, then we have uh, Reverend Brian Holmes, Pastor Holmes. And uh, Brian was on a show with me, I think it was last Friday, if I remember correctly, as we did kind of a promo. So, uh, Pastor Brian, it is so good to have you back with us. Uh, and uh, he has written a number of things for the disi discipling movement. He's writing some things for ABN to help them to, to share what leadership development is all about. So, uh, Pastor Brian, so good to have you. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. He's there. He's in the window. Oh, just a few minutes okay, ago. There, there you are. <laughs> there you are. Thank you, thank you, uh, Reverend Bill. Um, I'm happy to be here and excited to talk about this with you guys. Yes, thanks. Thanks for joining us. And then we have uh, another Brian. So this might be a little confusing as we talk tonight, but uh, Pastor Brian Beal. Pastor, uh, he is involved in leadership and, and helping to, to integrate new believers in a mega church in Fort Wayne. And so, uh, Pastor Brian, it is so good to have you. Welcome to the show tonight. Thank you. I'm so excited to be able to share. We've been praying for the people that are watching this because we want Very you good. to be enriched as we are enriched. Very good. Very good. Well, again, we are delighted that uh, folks have joined us tonight. Uh, we're broadcasting live over a number of social media outlets. Uh, for I think one of the easiest ways is just go to www.abnsat.com, click on the live uh, link, and you will be able to Others will be able to watch us live. So anyway, right there, right there it is on the screen. Uh, let me just encourage you to go there. But there are many other ways in which you can watch it or you can watch it later on YouTube and Facebook, ABN Facebook and ABN or Trinity Channel, um, YouTube. So anyway, it's great to continue our subject. Last night, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the character of the leader. We just felt that that was foundational. Uh, maybe character plays uh, the most important role in the Christian community and leadership as to any other realm of leadership. For example, maybe you're a CEO in a, just a secular company 
And while there are some standards, yet you probably are not held to the same moral standards that uh, those in ministry and those in Christian leadership are. Uh, and we could go on down the line. So character is really important. We decided that last night. Well, we want to talk about building a, a, character, a culture of character and what that means for us. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Doug. Uh, how, do, how do we build into our followers? We're talking about those that we're helping to disciple. We're, we're basing this off of Matthew 28, 18 to 20, where Jesus said, uh, all authority is given to me. Now I'm in putting that on you. I'm giving that to you. Now go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all the things that I've commanded you. So how do we begin to build a, a culture of Christian character in the lives of those we are leading? Well, I, <clears throat> I think the most important thing is our own example, our own walk. Uh, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And Jesus said, the, the student is not above the master. Uh, so our, our disciples will only rise to the level uh, that we have. So if our leadership is shaky, if our leadership is inconsistent, if our moral compass is a little off, then our disciples are going to be that way. Uh, if, if they can see in us a reflection of Christ, then that is going to be a big factor in developing that kind of character in them. It's not the only factor, but you can teach all day long. You can preach all day long. If they don't see it in your life, it's not going to be effective. All right, very good. Uh, Brian Holmes, you wanna, wanna jump in there, Brian? Sure, I, I want to uh, affirm everything that Douglas said, you know, inf influencing others, making disciples and shifting cultural standards happens from an inside out and top down approach. We need to lead by example, you know, inside out means starting with our personal lives and working outward from there. Uh, top down means they'll follow our example we can't expect them to do what we're not doing, and we need to hold ourselves and be regularly teaching them Christ's standards when it comes to morality um, and godliness. And this it has to happen in our teachings, in our worship, in our activities, in our communal prayers. We need to just regularly be letting the entire congregation know that we're pursuing godliness, and that's that's you know, a key thing that we're doing as, you know, and it has to come from leadership and then continually be reminded to them in order for it to become the culture. Um, so those who we seek to influence need to see from us and learn from us and believe that victory over sin and godliness is possible for those who belong to Jesus. And they need to feel like they can come to this place and learn from us and come together one another and feel like it's a safe place so that they can learn and share and unburden and seek healing and guidance and prayer and that they won't be judged and condemned for um, sharing their struggles. They need to know that we're all trying to be more like Jesus and we're all moving towards that goal. And if we're modeling it to them, then they will follow. Very good. I appreciate that uh, so much, Brian. Brian Beal, uh, I know that you are involved uh, at a very uh, dedicated level to helping to integrate people into the faith, helping them to, to find them their way and growing Christ. <clears throat> what would you add to maybe what the guys have already said? Uh, you're, you're really interested also, like we all are, in building this culture. Yeah. You want to respond? Yeah. So um, I I love what uh, the notes that I wrote as I was reading through this the, this material and, and thinking about this question. Um, I think for me, as I look at the leaders that um, that really raised me to be the leader that I am today, uh, there were qualities in them that I saw that I realized that these are the qualities in leaders that create that culture of character. Uh, one of them is is transparency. 
Um, I have had leaders in my life where I knew uh, about where kind of the, the secrets were in their life, the things that people, um, you know, may not always see, but they let me in and they were transparent with me so that I could see that they weren't perfect, um, that I could see where they struggled in life. I could see their, so the questions they were asking God and, and their journey in faith. And so I think transparency is such a critical character trait that is missing in leaders. And then it's not translated into the culture uh, of their followers. Another one is uh, vulnerability. Um, when uh, my pastor, you know, I'm, I'm one of the pastors in our local church, but my pastor, um, the one that um, is um, this, the, the lead pastor, um, his wife passed away a number of years ago. And he went from being a loving husband, a father of four, to being a single dad and, and a widower. And, and it was incredibly tragic. And I remember for two years, um, as I listened to, you know, obviously every sermon, every service um, that our church had for two years, I could count on one hand the number of times he didn't mention his journey, that he didn't talk about his hardship and, and really the pain that he was walking through. And so that vulnerability, I think, was what drew people because, you know, another, another trait that, that really has to be built into that culture is, is honesty. And uh, that goes even beyond the, the vulnerability. But I think I, I think transparency and vulnerability are such a critical uh, a traits that have to be in that 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 leader that in, it gets translated into the culture. Good. Let me back up. Then uh, Brian, you helped to get us into this. Thank you. Uh, nice segue. Uh, but we we were talking last night. We we're talking about the passages in First Timothy, the pack, passages in Titus. There are some others uh, about the uh, character that was required for uh, an elder, for a deacon. And as you and, and that was that's not particularly our topic tonight, but maybe uh, as Brian has mentioned, guys, um, think back. Maybe what is what are some of the key characters, character points that you saw in those who maybe encouraged you? Hmm. Uh, uh, one of the one of the biggest influences in my life, I didn't realize it till later in life, was my father. He was a pastor, and one I mean, I mean, I learned several things from him just by being around him. But he was always he was in a church culture where the pastor was the leader. And he virtually was looked upon as inerrant. And he struggled so much with that because if he, if he felt like he couldn't do it or he was failing or he didn't have the wisdom for a decision, he felt like people looked at him and thought he was, he was a failure. And I, I think what I learned was the negative of that that you as a leader, and, and Brian Beal brought this out, uh, you have to be willing to say, look, I'm not there yet either. And it's when I've shared my struggles, my, my failures, it's when I've shared those with other leaders that I have found them most open then to say, I struggle too. And how, how do we grow from this? Yeah. So that's kind of a backdoor one, but I mean, sure. probably in my life, that was one of the most impactful. You know, I, I think of several places in scripture and I love the life of Moses. You remember when he had the call uh, there in Exodus chapter three, when you have the burning bush, God shows up, says, I've seen what's been happening and Moses said, yes, I'm so excited that now you're going to do something, God. And God says, uh, Moses, it's going to be you. And, and, and we, I'm glad the Bible shows it. He, he finds five reasons why he's not the guy. Right. You know, my picture's still in the post office, you know, in Egypt. Right. Uh, and, you know, right on down the list. And then, then later on, uh, God... Uh, He's been to Pharaoh a couple of times and the people are against him and Pharaoh's against him. And he said, Lord, why should I go back? 
and I love the scriptures. It just said, nobody wants to listen to me. Nobody's paying any attention to me. I, I'm just, I'm going to quit. God said, no, you're not. Now get up. I think, I think it's kind of a forceful experience. So said, now get up and lead. I want you to go to Pharaoh again. So anyway, I just find, I find that passage interesting, uh, really interesting. Brian, um, Brian Holmes, uh, <clears throat> maybe, maybe a leader in your life that really influenced you and maybe uh, some character aspect that stands out for you. Yeah, I think drawing from uh, what you guys have already said, the main an attribute that really stands out to me is humility. It's, it's really, uh, we see that even though Moses was, you know, actually just sort of trying to get away from what God was calling him to do. But even throughout Scripture and then in, throughout the New Testament, we see we see humility really being emphasized as a primary attribute. And really, I think that's one of the key things that keeps us in right relationship with God and being a good leader is humility. It, and that might it, it's our own the recognition of our own shortcomings. You know, those times when we're not loving as much as we could be loving and we're not. Um, encouraging as much as we could be and so forth that actually when we hold ourselves up to the standard of Jesus that draws us to realize just how far short we're falling of of God's glory and to me that is I've when I've seen humility in other leaders that's something I've always admired just their their willingness to be vulnerable and it's good if we can do it with, with those we trust. But I think even if we're, there's a certain level of contentment that you can reach and to where you can just kind of be open and vulnerable with your whole audience because you feel like the Lord, the Lord has you. And so I've kind of come to that place where I'm like, I can just, I can just sort of, okay, here's stuff that I've struggled with and that's okay. And if, you know, some people might judge or whatever, but, um, I found it that when I'm hearing other people do that, it's like, okay, they're just like me. They're, they're not perfect either. And their willingness to be humble is, is actually better than their desire to just try to look perfect because God actually desires that humility. It actually gets us in right relationship with him when we're willing to say, okay, I can't do this on my own. I need you, Lord. I need you to give me the strength. I need you to give me the love and the grace and everything else so that I can model it for these people and so that they can learn it as well. And so it just shows our humility shows how much we need God and, mm -hmm. and, and points us back to why we're so dependent upon him. Good. Good. Thanks, Brian. All right. I, I want to, I want to go back even a little bit further. We are in this. Uh, and if you just joined us, we are in this marathon, uh, actually 10 shows this week, two every night for this entire week. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about discipleship. How do we make disciples? How do we start discipleship movements that literally change the face of Christendom? So, uh, but to do that, we, we need to come to Christ. And I'm always, I'm always interested, and I find that people who have made the commitment are always glad to share about how they came to Christ. And I think we're going to discover, we, we've already discovered, and we will discover the rest of this week, that not all of us come to Christ the same way, and we were not all discipled the same way. Jesus didn't say, you got to do it this way. He said, simply disciple them, baptize them, teach them. And so I'm going to start with you, uh, Brian Beal. And just give us a snapshot of how you came to Christ and how, in your experience, you were discipled. Yeah, I love telling the story, and, and every Christian does. We love to talk about how we came out of darkness and we saw light, and that light transformed us from the inside out. Um, I, was, uh, I am blessed to have a mom and a dad who were already Christ followers before I was born. And so from the womb, my parents prayed for me. They wanted God's best in my life. And so they raised uh, my siblings and I in a house of 
faith. And one of the challenges that my parents faced was they were both, um, my, both my mom and my dad were first generation Christians. They did not have parents who believed in Jesus. And so they were the first healthy marriage they ever really saw. They were the first healthy parents they ever really saw. Uh, they, they, they had to kind of figure things out. And one of the things that they needed to do was to find a local church that they could plant themselves in, that they could learn from the teachings of the pastor and, and meet other moms and dads, other husbands and wives where they could be discipled. And then they could learn what to do with their children because I'm the third born. So there were two older brothers of mine uh, where they got to make their mistakes until they got it right with me, which is great. I'm very thankful for that. And um, my parents prayed. And, uh, you know, I heard about Jesus growing up. He was the subject of, of what we would talk about at dinner. And my dad would, you know, uh, share about the challenges that he had. And uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents uh, allowed me to go to uh, a camp where I was uh, around other Christians. And, and it was just for a couple of days. And it was a chance for, um, for me to be around uh, people I didn't know. And I heard the gospel presented in a way I'd never heard before. And it was asked of me, are you ready to recognize that you are a sinful person apart from Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ paid the price for your redemption? And would you uh, step into the grace that's been given to you? And I, that night, made that decision. I'll never forget the gentleman who, who led me through that process. He took me to a phone and I called my mom and dad that night to tell them the decision that I had made, the decision they'd been praying for for many years at that point. Right. And as I grew into my teenage years, I found myself uh, in uh, the presence of a pastor who had great influence in my life because I really liked him. I wanted to know what he knew. I love listening to him teach. And he found something in me. He saw something in me. He, God told him or showed him that there was a future for me in ministry. And he didn't tell me that. He began to put me in positions where I was beginning to exercise serving others and loving others and caring for others in situations that then I began to see what God was doing. God was opening my heart to ministry. And that pastor didn't say, Brian, you are going to become a pastor one day. Uh, he showed me that God was showing me that. And, and it was great uh, to hear years later, as he said, Brian, I did all that on purpose. I wanted you to find what God was doing. <clears throat> I put you in positions where you had to learn and you had to rely on God. And so for me, you know, that was so critical. And I, I want that now for our children. I want our children to see the passion of their mom and dad in Christ. And I want them to find those Christian leaders who are going to pour into them as, as I was poured into by those leaders. And, and I want them to see all that God has for their future. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a, it's a wonderful story. I, I am blessed to have the people in my life who were there at those moments, uh, when I wasn't sure what was going on, but they knew something and they helped me see what God was doing. And so I'm very thankful for that. Hey, Brian, I want to stay with you in just, a, just for a moment tonight. We, there may be somebody that is watching or listening to this program. They, they're not, they, Christianity may be totally foreign to them. Uh, they, they don't know much about Christ. They, don't know, they know very little, maybe less about the Bible. And yet you were talking about this invitation, this offer that uh, somebody presented to you. And so would you say that if somebody's out there and tonight and they, some, maybe there's a, a hunger in their heart, they, they may not understand it. Is there hope for them? And you also mentioned a couple steps, like finding the church, maybe get the, you want to maybe just open that up just a little bit? Yeah. So here's what we know. We know that we have a creator in heaven who made each one of us in his image. And so we have already the access to a God because we are not made by accident. We are not here by accident. We're here because he made us and, and he's uh, created everything in us and around us. And he's calling out to each one of us. Um, we, uh, we believe, uh, I believe firmly 
that my father in heaven wants a relationship with me and every other person he created. And unfortunately, because our world has things called sin, has brokenness in it, we can't. And because God is a holy God and he, uh, he can't have relationship with that. So he sent his son, Jesus, who is God. Jesus came, he, he taught, he lived, he died, and he came back to life. Mm -hmm. I believe that the tomb that Jesus was placed in is empty today. There is not a body there. There is not a skeleton there. He came back to life. And that Jesus, that God, he is calling out to each one of us. He sure. wants to have a relationship with us. And so the voice in your head, the voice in your heart, the one that's calling to you, at that the reason that you're here watching this is a living God who wants to have a relationship with you. And so you're not alone in this world. You are surrounded by other people who believe in Jesus. And we're here for you. And we're praying for you. We're praying that you would call out to Jesus. He will answer back. That's the beautiful thing about prayer. When we pray to him, he answers. And so we're praying that you'll find that. And so Jesus is that answer for us. Thank you. And uh, as you were talking, Brian, they put up... Uh, ABN Global Reap, R E A P, I think it's dot com. ABN Global Reap. And if you pray that prayer tonight, if you just, and you may not know the words, you, you may say, God, I don't know if I'm praying this right. Uh, but if you'll just cry out to God, He will hear your cry and He will come into your life and change you. And if you go to ABN Global Reap dot com, you will find some Bible studies that will help you to grow in the Lord. So I trust, I do trust that you will do that. Uh, Doug, let's, uh, let's come back to you and tell us a little bit about your conversion experience. You said you were raised in a pastor's home, that, but that doesn't, uh, that doesn't automatically make you a Christian. Uh, that's for sure. No, it doesn't. How did you come to Christ? How were you a disciple? Well, uh, I came to Christ very young. Uh, I can still play the videotape in my brain of the night that I came home from church in the evening and the gospel had been presented. And I told my parents, I need Jesus. I didn't understand all the theology, but I knew I needed him. And we knelt down by, by the living room couch and I accepted Christ that night. And I've never questioned that. That commitment of him. I haven't always lived it out like I should, but I've never questioned that commitment. Amen. Um, I was discipled uh, a lot, of course, by my parents. Uh, I can remember when I was about 16, my dad came to me and he said, we need a teacher in the junior boys Sunday school class. And I said, okay. And he said, here's the quarterly. You're <laughs> on next week. And I said, Dad, I can't do this. He said, yes, you can. You know enough about the Bible. You have been, you've been listening. You've been learning. You developed that, that ministry. And for several years, I taught the junior boys Sunday school class. Sure. Now, I learned more than those boys ever did. But it was that kind of, I mean, that was the way my dad was. He would throw you in the deep end of the pool and he was always there to be to help you, but he yep. just knew if you were ready, he would just kind of kick you out of the nest, and off you went. Yep. Uh, so uh, th those kinds of uh, experiences, while terrifying at times, also prompted me to say, "Wow, the Lord really is going to help me in this. Uh, I really." With his help, I can do this. Sure. And, and uh, I can remember going to the hospital with my dad, uh, standing there. Just I didn't I didn't say anything or do anything, but I learned by watching him how to minister to people who were in pain, who were suffering, who were dying, uh, and and anybody today would say, why would you take a fourteen year old? or 16 year old kid to the hospital when someone is dying. Well, I think my dad knew that there, there was within me that, that capability is kind of like what Brian said of being a pastor. 
And he wanted me exposed to those situations early. So I would learn how to do it. And I did. I learned a lot. That those, those have a lot. Those things have a lot to say about those that we're leading, uh, how sometimes we need to approach them. OK, Brian, I want to come to you. We're going to go to a break here in just, uh, oh, just a couple of minutes. But uh, just why don't you, um, well, they, they're saying that we need to take a break right now. Brian, when we come back, Brian Holmes, when we come back, uh, let's, I'd like to hear how you came to Christ, how you were discipled, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll pick up with the rest of our conversation. But we're going to take a break, just about three or four minutes, and we trust that you will stay with us. We'll be back. We want to continue this about creating this culture uh, that is involving biblical character and also making disciples. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Join us Wednesday, April 21st for special programming, What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 1, premiering at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 2. Both shows will be hosted by Rev. Dr. Bill Hostler with special guests Rev. Phil Whitmore, Rev. Ron Williams, and Rev. Sean Azaro. ABN is excited to let our viewers know about Rev. Bill Hostler, Chairman of the ABN Board of Directors, latest books on Christian living. Dr. Bill has two books out right now, Divine Benedictions and Divine GPS. In Divine GPS, have you longed for guidelines to help in discovering God's will for your life? Divine GPS will provide some markers in sorting out the various voices, plans, and feelings about your next move. At the end of a service, many pastors pray or say a blessing or benediction over their congregation. But also, how meaningful when someone blesses another individual. These biblical statements are words of comfort, direction, encouragement, and promise for those to whom they are spoken. Dr. Bill has put 12 of these passages of scripture together along with some commentaries to help believers in their Christian life. This is a great book to use for your devotional reading. For more books by Rev. Bill Hostler and his wife Margaret Hostler, visit www.kministries.com. For more discipleship resources and information, visit www.trinitychannel.com or email us at info at trinitychannel.com. We're watching Trinity Channel. Welcome back. Uh, we are in the process of a, a week of, of classes and it actually shows on what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a leader of others, what it means to teach discipleship, and hopefully what it means to be one who seeks to be a disciple of Jesus. So we're glad that you have tuned in and uh, we have our panel tonight, and we were talking about uh, how they came to Christ, how they were discipled in their faith, how they grew. You know, Jesus said, I want you to go and I want you to make disciples. So what does that mean? Well, he talks about teaching them to observe and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if, you're, if you are some way involved in this whole thing of the Christian faith, uh, you're called to be a discipler. You're called to lead somebody. He said, I'm no leader. But, you know, you might have a child that you can help lead to faith in Christ. That's part of your responsibility. You may have a coworker. You may have a student at school. And uh, so anyway, uh, we want to be talking about that. So uh, we were talking to Brian Holmes, one of our panelists tonight. And Brian, uh, I, I'd ask you before the break to be thinking about how you came to Christ uh, and how you were grounded in the faith. Well, I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and I knew the Lord, but I was mischievous as a child and um, rebellious, and so I fell away for many years throughout high school. And you know, I, I was I was one of those Christians who would wear the cross and call myself a Christian, but I was living far from uh, Jesus's 
uh, influence on my life and and with biblical standards. And so I finally uh, woke up to certain parts of that and around age 17, and I felt like I was crying out to the universe saying, okay, I've got the rest of my life kind of back together. I'm not, you know, getting in trouble the way that I was before. I'm not living wicked anymore, but I still feel like something's missing. And I sort of cried out to the universe, like what's missing? And Jesus said, it's me. You've forsaken Mm -hmm. your first love. And, you know, I I would love to say that my story ended there, but it didn't. So I kind of was wayward for a while, for many years still. And I was still, I was a devout um, believer in Jesus, but he was my savior and not necessarily my Lord for a lot of years. So uh, many years later, I, I, I think I started going to church. I'd stop reading the word and I'd stop going to church for many years. And it's easy to be wayward when that happens. You, you can still believe in God, but you're not following Jesus. You're not being a disciple. And so I started going to church and I started reading the word and I started listening to worship music and start worshiping. And it was sort of the combination of those things that really um, the Holy Spirit used them to convict my heart and say, okay, I need, Jesus said, okay, you've, this is sort of the third time that you've, uh, you know, put me back into your life. And then are you going to keep doing that? And I realized, okay, I've fallen three times and come back three times. I'm not going to turn back this time. I'm giving you everything, Lord. And from that point, it was just the decision. And I didn't really have um, any one key leader that influenced my life. Um, I was actually still kind of an introvert and I still sort of did things my own way. So I, it actually would have been a lot easier knowing what I know now, uh, but I kind of did it the hard way. I I paid attention. I took notes during sermons. I soaked up everything I could. I, I listened to sermons and read books throughout the week. I was listening to Bible studies for hours a day and reading the word and and studying and praying and, and really just drawing near to the Lord. And I really feel like he, I like the Lord discipled me. Um, you know, it was kind of a very spiritual experience. I didn't have people that I felt like came alongside and helped me do it. So I, it was definitely probably harder that way and took longer that way. But it was, it it also kind of taught me that if we seek the Lord with, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, then he'll be there and he'll guide us to where he wants us to be. Um, Even if there aren't a lot of people in our lives that, that we've realized could be helping us do this. So uh, knowing that now, um, that that encourages me and lets me know that anyone who who genuinely wants to follow Jesus can, even if they're kind of feeling like they're on their own, they're in a small community, or they don't have people in their family or friends that are Christians yet, you should definitely get into some type of church and some small group and grow with other believers. But even if it's hard at first, if you're in the middle of nowhere and there's just you, you can still follow Jesus and be a disciple, um, and you can start something yourself. Very good. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, you opened the door <clears throat> for us, and we're talking about building this culture. Uh, so we have people out there who are watching tonight. Uh, maybe they will make a decision to follow Christ tonight, or maybe they made one a little while ago. How do we help them? What are, what are some words of advice? Uh, and they may be in a culture where they don't have access to churches like, say, we in the West do. or uh, it, it may be clandestine, or maybe it's open, but they just don't quite know what to do. Brian, uh, Bill, I'm going to start with you. What, what are some steps? What are some things? We started to talk about this uh, when I was talking with you previously. What are some things that they can do to help them to get grounded? Yeah, I think it uh, first, you need a copy of the Bible, the scriptures. These are the words God has given us. And so today, right now, you can know uh, God's heart because his words are recorded. So if you have a phone, if you have an ability to get even online to get a copy of those scriptures. Or if you know someone who does, you can begin to see the heart of God and understand the heart of God by reading his words 
And so the Bible contains all of that. It is a one. Hey, Brian. Yes. Let, let me uh, interrupt. So uh, with the Internet, there really people can somebody may not know um, where to find a Bible or where to get a Bible or what kind of Bible. But with the Internet, there really uh, are many options to, to find in a Bible. What, what, what do they do? Where do they look? What, what do they go after? Yeah, there's a great website, BibleGateway.com, that will give you in multiple languages uh, a way to read scripture in your language, BibleGateway.com. Another one would be on a phone. There is an app called YouVersion, which is Y-O-U version. So YouVersion. And again, you can read the Bible in multiple languages uh, and begin to search what God has for you in his word. Okay, where do where do I start? Uh, you know, there's this Bible, sixty six books. Where do I start? Uh, what do I look for? If you're on BibleGateway.com, or if you have a U version app on your phone, and you're able to to get a copy of scriptures, and there's going to be that search bar, just search the name Mark. Mark is uh, a, a man who lived with Jesus and uh, followed um, these teachings of Jesus. And he wrote from a human perspective uh, as God led him to understand what Jesus was about. And it's the story of Jesus written from uh, a man who was in that time and was recording what Jesus uh, had done. So Mark is a wonderful short uh, book that goes through the stories of Jesus. All right. Thanks, Brian. Hey, Doug, I want to come to you. You've written over 30 books now and uh, a number of those deal with uh, book studies of the Bible uh, also. And so I, I know this whole area of training and a small group study and individual study is important to you. What do you want to what do you want to add to what uh, Brian has said about that? Uh, and where else can they look? Well, Brian gave the right answer uh, with the Gospel of Mark, uh, I think because it's a very uh, accessible account of Jesus' life. And there are four Gospels. I think people need to realize that if they start with the New Testament, uh, you know, it's like the same story over and over with different emphasis. So start with Mark. And then I always send people to, um, to the book of Acts if they are interested in how the story developed and how those early Christians uh, spread the message of Jesus throughout the world. Um, it's always a, a it's a challenge, and it and it kind of pumps that interest in being a disciple and a disciple maker. Uh, and so, I the Book of Acts, which comes after the four Gospels, is a great one. So um, we have the we have the, the two testaments, the Old Testament, right? The first basically two thirds of the Bible. We have the last third, which is the New Testament. We have the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which you call the Gospels. And then we have the Book of Acts. So you're saying in that search bar in one of those Bible programs, look for Mark. The Gospel of Mark. You, when you read that, you can look for the Book of Acts, which okay. basically tells the story of what was happening in the lives of the disciples after Jesus ascended back to heaven. Right. Okay. The book, the book of Romans, is always a great book. It's a little heavy, but it's the foundational truths of Scripture, and okay. I think that that's a a great book. The thing, you, the thing you have to remember is you're going to read, and you're not going to understand or comprehend everything that's there, but read it. It's the Word of God, and and as you grow, as you read more you will comprehend more. You'll come back to those. I hope. I mean, everyone should read the Gospel of Mark many times over the course of their, their Christian life. And then you may want to go to the Gospel of John. Uh, Jesus talks about, uh, you know, he has those encounters with individuals, with the crowds. Um, anytime you can read and study the Scripture with other believers— is always a plus, especially if you're a young believer, Good. because they're going to have insights 
they're going to have a, a more knowledgeable understanding. And, and so if, if there's uh, one or two Christians that you know, or in, if you're part of a church and they have a small group ministry or go to the pastor and say, I need a small group. I need, I need a group of people who will help me. Um, that's always very helpful and they'll pray for you. They'll encourage you uh, sure. to do that. Okay. Uh, Brian Holmes, uh, I want, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here, but um, we talked about getting to the scripture, and I think you would certainly concur with that. But we also talked about, I think maybe you talked about it, uh, or one of the guys did, about finding a church, a group of believers. The scriptures talk about don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Uh, COVID makes that a little bit challenging sometimes. And some of our, our listeners and viewers are maybe in a community, in a, a country where uh, church attendance is really frowned on and they're persecuted with that. But talk to us a little bit about what, are, what, should, what should they be looking for in a church? What are some things that say, yeah, this is a, this is a church that I probably should connect with? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, if if there's not a, if there's not many local churches or the churches that exist are not meeting regularly, then that makes things more difficult. But um, you know, it's important to remember that it's it's the people, it's the body of Christ, it's it's all the believers that are the church, not the building. So even when you come together with one other person, you essentially become a church, and. You're, it becomes an expression of the church, of the global church. And so the things to look for, you want to look for sound biblical doctrine, meaning that they trust in the Bible, they believe in the Bible, they believe it's the word of God, and all of their beliefs and practices are based on things that are taught in the Bible. So that's key. So that's why you need to be reading the Bible so that you know if they're doing that. Um, and you're double checking the things that they say when you when you're getting started and you're making sure that you're submitting to God through his word and that they are too. Um, so I would look for that. You want to look for what is the point of the church. So the point of the church is to make disciples, right? To For us to become more like Jesus and to make more people to become more like Jesus and to spread his kingdom on the earth and to glorify God in heaven. And so when we come together, there's a spirit of love there. There's a spirit of um, joy there. You want, you want worship that, that praises God and loves God and, and is full of the Holy Spirit, meaning you feel that the Holy Spirit is present there um, in, in the worship and in the fellowship, that people um, love God and they're being changed by God and they're loving one another as a result. And through that, then they'll also become missional. So they'll, they'll care about things like evangelism. They'll, they'll care about things like, um, deeper study and, and showing ourselves approved by studying the word of God together. Um, there'll be small group fellowship. You know, it, it's either a small church where that's kind of built in or it's a larger church with an emphasis on small groups so that people are growing in uh, fellowship together and doing life together. Because it's not church is not something we just go to. It's something we're a part of. So if if you only see them for an hour every week, then you're probably not emphasizing church the way that Jesus intended it, because his followers walked and talked with him and lived life with him. And so our churches need to model all of these things as well. All right, good. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Well, uh, so we've talked about um, Bible reading, how important that is, probably on a daily basis. I always encourage people to get started on a daily basis. And rather than maybe taking a long period of time, like say, you know, I'm going to do this for an hour, you know, it might be better to do it for 10 minutes or five minutes and do it consistently than to do it for an hour for a week and quit. That's always my advice, you know, do, do what you can do and you'll grow into it, but maybe start small and then build from there. We talked about getting into a, a good church, 
trying to find this a group of believers. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm always amazed that in some of the areas where maybe we don't know what to do, if a person prays and asks the Holy Spirit to help lead them to maybe a group of believers or somebody that can help to disciple them, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit can do that and help draw them uh, into uh, this kind of a relationship. Well, um, we want to, uh, I like to call disciple making more an art than a science. Please understand, science would be uh, that you know, this, these are the rules and this is the way it happens, uh, but it doesn't always happen that way. Uh, we've all had disciples that, and so I, I like to think about the art of disciple making rather than the science of disciple making. Uh, for example, how do you correct, let's say you have a disciple that, you know, you're trying to ground in the Lord and they, they really are open. How do you correct them? How do you suggest something, a different path that, hey, what you're doing right now, it's going to get you into trouble. What do you, how do you say, say those things? Hmm. Doug? Well, I think, I think that you hit the key is their openness. Um, sometimes, and this is where we have to pray for discernment. We have to say, Lord, I see this in this person's life. Is this the right time? That's good. That's because good. you can you can damage somebody, you can wound somebody if you do it in the wrong spirit at the wrong time. Uh, I I mean it doesn't mean you tolerate something really bad for forever, but to just pray for that opportunity. I mean, sometimes when I've got to confront someone about an issue or something that they've done. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, you know, I know I'm going to see him on Sunday and I'll say, Lord, if you really want me to talk to this person today, just make, give me an opportunity, make it clear. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, so the timing is important. And then the spirit is important to, to go to that person, not in a public way, not not to shame them, not to, you know, mm -hmm. shake your finger at them, but to say, you know, brother, this is, I've, I've observed this in your life. I love you. And I know what's going to happen down the road, or I know what this is going to develop into. You, you and I need to figure out a way and be partner with them. You and I need to figure out a way that we can start to deal with this. And uh, sometimes, you know, people are ready to go. Other times you'll feel that, no way, I'm not gonna, no, I'm not gonna give this up. And that tells you something about them. Sure. Uh, and where they are in the whole disciple, uh, discipling process. If there's resistance, then, uh, you know, I mean, Jesus, when when people said, well, I, you know, I want to do this or I, I'm, I've got to go do this. Jesus said, go ahead. Uh, we say, come, 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 come. Jesus said, maybe you ought to go home for a while. Maybe you ought to think about this. Mm -hmm. Maybe you ought to count the cost uh, before you say you're going to follow me. And I, I don't think that's a salvation issue. I think that's a discipling issue. And and so sometimes when people, I've had people come to me and say, oh, I think God's calling me to be a pastor. And I'll say, wonderful. That is exciting. Here's how to start. Take a class. Uh, get involved. Be faithful. Be here every Sunday that you can be. be, be take on a ministry of some kind. Oh, I don't know about all that. <laughs> I just thought, you know, it kind of fell on you. Or, no, no, there's got to be demonstration here of your character. And if there's not a demonstration of character, then the church is not going to trust you with leadership. Sure. Uh, Brian Beal, what do you want to add? I mean, you're in a large church, a very large church. 
and uh, you interact with these people all the time. Um, do you have any kind of rules of thumb that you follow? You're the leader now and you, you see some things that, uh, well, we, we need to be working. Maybe it's, maybe it's one of your teachers. Maybe it's one of your leaders. How, how do you address that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there are only um, a few words Jesus gave us where we are given instructions on how we address um, uh, issues between brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, in, in one of those spots in, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus says that if a brother or sister sins against you, go to them one on one and have a conversation with them. If they listen to you, you've won them over. And so in my adult life, one thing that I have been taught and shown, and then now it, it is a part of my life, is that I constantly remind myself, I want to be won over in one conversation. So if a leader comes to me or if a brother or sister of Christ comes to me and says, Brian, you have hurt me, you have sinned against me, something is wrong between us, I want it to take one conversation for me to lean in and find forgiveness with them, restore the relationship. It doesn't mean everything's going to be uh, wonderful after that, but it means that uh, I, I have heard them and I want to have a right relationship with them. And so when I have people in my life that um, I see that I need to confront them, I want to win them over in one conversation. I want to be honest with them. So that means I'm not going to go to anyone else. It means that I'm not going to take it to other people and tell other people what they did. I'm going to go to the person and we're going to speak one on one. And I want to win them over back to a relationship with me because Christ did that with me. He told me that I was wrong and I listened and I started a relationship with him. So I want to be won over. I want to win over the people around me as well so that we can have that relationship again. And it's it's. And isn't it easier when we sense that the person really cares about us and uh, is concerned about our own growth in the Lord and comes to us in a loving manner rather than an accusatory manner? I mean, there are times to be play the prophet role, but there are times also where we just simply wrap our arms around somebody and said, I love you, but I, I am concerned about this area of your life. Brian Holmes, what, what, you want to add something to what they've already said? about uh, this whole thing of how, how do we correct those who are our disciples? Yeah, I well, I want to affirm everything that they said. And ideally, if we can win them over, that is the absolute best case scenario. And we should always strive for that. Um, you know, they may persist in sin, but that's their choice. They have the free will to do that. And if if they're going to do that, let it be because it's it's a rejection of God's will. It's disobedience to God. Um, it's because they love their sin and not because we came in a harmful way that rubbed them further in the wrong direction. Um, you know, so we need to always come with grace and love and and forgiveness and try to disciple them. And then but still being clear about God's will and holiness. And, and then if they reject the counsel, you know, then like it says in Matthew 18, hopefully you can reach them. And if not, then, then you progress to, to greater levels of leadership. Um, you know, I, I think when it comes to being, I, I would say, I would agree fully that it's more of an art when it comes to, to when to approach and how to approach. Um, some of the things that are more like a science are just things that are clearly in scripture. So we can just know that they're always true. Um, one would be Matthew 18, Jesus' words about bringing somebody else's sin against them. Another one that since, since the other guys covered sort of the, the, this, you know, if you can win them over part of it, um, I'll sort of address the other side, which is what if you can't win them over? Um, and that's where, Paul talks about removing somebody from fellowship in 1 Corinthians 5. And in this case, you are, he also says it in 1 Timothy 5.20, um, those who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest will also be fearful of sinning. So these are, these are truths that come from God's word. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we should always do it or jump to that first, but we do need to know that that's, that's, sometimes necessary and we need to sometimes 
um, allow the one who won't change to, to be reprimanded in such a way that they won't stay and negatively affect the rest of the flock sure. because it's sort of like a poison in the bloodstream. If they're allowed to continue in their sin and everybody knows about it and we do nothing about it, then it will spread. And so we need to, you know, scripture says, hand him over to Satan. Hopefully the Lord will draw him to repentance. And then when they repent, then have everyone full of joy that they're repenting and and celebrating that they're now welcome back in fellowship. And it's this wonderful thing. Everyone should be forgiving and loving and just forgetting, you know, their previous sin, not holding it against them and welcoming them back. But we don't want to we don't want to love people so much that we let them get away with their sin, in which case we're, you know, we'd be dishonoring God and, be, God and being disobedient to, to God's will. So we sort of have to balance those things. Words well spoken from all of you. Thank you. Well, we're going to take a break. After the break, maybe you have some questions. You can call in and our screeners will take those questions. They'll forward them to us. And so uh, you can call us live through WhatsApp uh, with any questions or comments you have. And the number is there on your screen. And so if you have a question or some comment you'd like to uh, send that in, we welcome you to do so. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back for another 30 minutes, and we trust that you will stay with us and uh, join in as well. We'll be right back. Dear ABN viewers, in continuance to ABN's vision since 2020, this year's mission to the Far East and Africa, and working through the 1040 Window Project, we are pleased to announce the free discipleship courses in 15 different languages, including Asian and African languages like Persian, Turkish, Chinese, Russian, Yoruba, Urdu, Bengali, and other languages. In addition to European languages like English, French, and Spanish. These courses can be fully accessed for free through the following sites abnglobalreap.com, 1040discipleship.com, and abnsad.com. We thank the Lord for your constant support through prayers and through your donations that are necessary for the expansion of the ministry in order to reach millions of hearts that are thirsty for the living Word of God. For any questions or inquiries, you can visit our discipleship websites or call us on 248-416-1300 248-416-1300 May God bless you richly. Join us Wednesday, April 21st for special programming, What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 1, premiering at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 2. Both shows will be hosted by Rev. Dr. Bill Hostler, with special guests Rev. Phil Whitmore, Rev. Ron Williams, and Rev. Sean Azaro. You are watching Trinity Channel. Welcome back. Uh, we are glad to have you with us. I do want to say that tomorrow night we are going to have this subject of what leader Christian leadership is and is not. You know, there's a lot of thoughts about what leadership is. You know, do I have to claw my way to the top or what? So what is the what does the Bible have to say? And what are some practical things about leadership? What it is, what it is not. These are things that I, I want to teach to my children. Uh, as as they are developing their leadership skills. I want to say to them, guys, 
this is what leadership is, but this is what it is not. So that's tomorrow night. I trust that you will join in. And uh, we have a wonderful panel, some great guys that are going to be helping us sort through this. So I trust that you come back uh, tomorrow night. Now, we are continuing. We're going to have a also, I think we're going to have a call from uh, Dr. Uh, Bossom Goriel during this half hour. He's the founder of, of ABN uh, for now for 16 years. It's been going on. It started out just a small uh, radio ministry and now it's expanded worldwide. And so uh, he, I think he's going to be joining us this half hour. But I want to go back to our panel. And by the way, if you have um, questions that you would like to ask for our panelists or you maybe some comments that you'd like to make, you can just uh, call in uh, or go through the WhatsApp uh, with any of your questions or comments. And, and there's a number there also for you to call. So anyway, we want to go back to our, our uh, panel. And we've been talking about developing this, this culture uh, long term. Okay, uh, Doug, I want to come back to you. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So what does that what does what does that imply as far as building this culture? For example, it's probably not going to happen overnight. Right. <clears throat> it, it affects both the discipler and the disciple. Uh, the discipler has to say uh, it's not going to happen overnight. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, the things I want to see, I want to see right now. It's it's like our kids. You know, I want to see this developed right now. Well, it's not going to happen. So there's a patient persistence, I guess, that has to come where you don't just say, oh, well, it'll come in time. You know, we'll just let it. No, there's an intentionality about it. And there's a, there's a, a pattern that you follow. But understand that there's not... It's not. It, it took. It took me time to change in some areas of my life, and it's going to take my disciple sure. time in some areas of life. Sure. It also means the disciple can't just expect some glory cloud to come down and change everything in his life. Sure. But the part of the process is the struggle that we go through to change, to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit, to learn how to have victory over those areas of sin in our life to um, develop patterns of obedience that uh, and, and habits of discipline, whether it's reading scripture or, or prayer or uh, leadership in the church or participation in the church, all of those things take time to develop. They don't just, you know, they're the, the natural, the old rags of the old life that are still in us, uh, don't like those things. And so th there has to be that gradual putting off of the old, putting on of the new. And it's it's a process. That, it's still going on for me. I know Bill's pretty much reached perfection, but it's still going on for me. Yeah. And uh, you just, uh, I mean, that's part of what you have to factor in. Sure. Uh, again, it doesn't excuse laziness. I mean, read Paul, pursue, pursue, run, endure, box, fight. There's a there's an energy to it, but it does take time. Sure. Very good. Uh, Brian Beal, uh, in the light that this is a marathon and not a sprint, we're talking about you know, a lifetime of serving Christ. What, maybe, what does that say to you as a discipler, someone who wants to help people come and grow in their Christian walk? What What are a couple of things maybe that says to you? You understand that question? That's kind of maybe an awkward question, but. Well, yeah, I think I understand. I think that um, what it means is that uh, we can't take shortcuts. Um it takes uh, the, the best meals that any of us ever eat. It took the person who cooked it a long time to make it. There was planning and there was uh, a process and, 
and there were things that they had to do that took longer and and there were probably mistakes along the way or things in the way that they didn't anticipate but the result is the meal is an incredible experience for everyone who was there and a life well lived when you are uh, trusting in Jesus, not just for a day, not just for a week, or not even just for a year, but for many years and for many decades, a life well lived at the end, there is a celebration of all of the people who were impacted by your life. And so there are no shortcuts to this. Uh, we all, uh, you know, understand that you know, there are there are ways to make food fast. Well, fast food isn't always better food. It just is food, uh, but really good food, really, really well lived lives. They, yeah. they endure through a lot of, uh, a lot of time, a lot of low days and high days and everything in between. Good. Good. Well, you know, as a, as a pastor for many, many years, it, to me, it was building block upon block, brick upon brick, and when when you let's say you, you let's say you take a brick, it's not very big, and you got to put a lot of bricks in a wall to make a wall. But uh, I, I just always thought as a pastor, okay, I, I want to declare the whole counsel of God, and they're gonna, you know, God helping us, we're gonna build their lives up brick by brick. But we want it to be able to stand when the when the pressures come, uh, when things get tough. When there are disappointments, that that wall is solid and it's going to stand because we worked at it. We worked at it over a long period of time. Brian, I know that you are involved in helping to develop leadership. I think you've even written a book about it. You might want to. Uh, when it comes to this whole thing of, you know, developing leaders who are leaders of disciple people. So you want to address that? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, it, I have a lot of sections in my last book that came out last year called the Empowered Christian Roadmap, where I have one little section where I talk about just endurance in the faith. And as I was reflecting upon that, I, I feel like the Lord reminded me of Aesop's fable where called the tortoise and the hare. And the idea is, you know, the hare, the rabbit, just they were racing and he was just going to run straight to the end. But instead, he ran, and then he was so boastful that he ran far along down the track and then took a nap. And then the slow little turtle steadily plodded along, went right by the sleeping rabbit, and passed the finish line first. And there's a lesson there about perseverance. It's not about who's the fastest or who has the most extravagant spiritual gifts or who has the most energy and enthusiasm in the beginning. It's about who crosses the finish line. Mm -hmm. And so we need to emphasize this in ourselves and in one another in discipleship. Um, it's, it's the slow and steady that wins the race. Now, ideally we should be like rabbits who are, or turtles who occasionally get, fuel from the Holy Spirit to be a rabbit from time to time. That would be the best scenario. Sure. Um, but, you know, Jesus gave multiple examples of this using an analogy of a field that seed was sown into. And some of the seeds went into soil that were choked out by the thorns, which would be like the enemy, Satan. Mm -hmm. And then some of the seeds were sown. And it, one of the things that always stands out to me is one of the seeds, they receive it with joy and it sprouts up and it's, and it's big and beautiful and loud. And, and, ev and this would be the one, this would be the people in the church who, who stand out the most, they're the most excited, the most loud at worship that their hands raise the highest, but it says they had no roots. So when troubles come, they quickly fall away. So when the trials come, the temptations come, when the wor another seed is the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth, and when, they, when these things come, those fall away. It's those who have roots in the soil, meaning they have, there's, there's a deeper uh, desire and a love for God. There's a deeper commitment to Christ. There's a deeper understanding of good doctrine, and, and they, they have they've wrestled with the tough stuff of the faith and decided I'm going to be here 
forever. I'm not giving up on Jesus and I know he'll get me through it. And I know trials and stuff will come. It's inevitable. It's guaranteed in scripture, but I'm going to be here and I believe in Jesus and I know he's going to get me through the finish line. And it's those who keep going. So when I'm doing discipleship, the goal is not, I mean, we want to encourage everybody, but we're really looking to invest the most time in those who we're trying to grow roots in. We're like, okay, I don't want to just give you a word of encouragement. I want to see you get deep roots. I want to see you stick around for the long run. Sure. And it, and if we do that and we help them know that they need to be doing that for themselves as well, then we're going to see better long-term fruit that lasts. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. You know, there are two gentlemen in scripture that I think about. I mean, there are a lot of them, but I think of John Mark started out on a missionary journey with you, with Paul. Evidently, maybe got homesick or whatever reason, he went back. Paul and Barnabas, you remember, split over whether or not they're going to take John Mark on the next journey. However, we find John Mark later, uh, Paul embraces him, said, you know, when he comes, make sure he brings these things with him. The other one is Demas. Uh, do you remember he was also a co-worker with Paul? And Paul writes, and Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. I, I really feel sorry for Demas. I, you know, maybe I've, I feel uh, maybe that's, that's one of those sad passages of scripture because we don't know whether Demas ever got back. He, he was in it evidently for the sprint, not the marathon. And John Mark evidently saw it as the marathon because he, he did get restored and he, he was on. So uh, I, I think it's important that we help our disciples to understand, hey, you're in this for the long haul. And what a joy as a pastor to be able to look back to somebody you haven't seen for 15 years and they're still walking solidly in the faith. Isn't that a joy, pastors? Hey, we have a, a guest, uh, well, he's not a guest. He, he's the director of ABN. And uh, Dr. Bossom, welcome to our program tonight. We're glad that you've joined us. We're having a great time talking about building a culture uh, of biblical character and uh, how we work to develop our our uh, disciple people we're discipling. So and I know that's right down your alley, and uh, because you're the one who's had this vision of developing this discipleship arm of ABN. So welcome to the program. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Bill. God bless you, all of you, Pastor Bill and Reverend Douglas and Reverend Brian Beals, and Pastor Brian Holmes, all of you, God bless you. This is a great show, a great topic, and uh, I am, it's awesome. I'm excited. Do you hear me clearly, Pastor Bill? Ah, uh, we hear you very well. Yep, you're coming across fine. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I thank you, all of you. And uh, let me just at the beginning say a special thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Reverend uh, uh, Bill Hustler for organizing and uh, coordinating and uh, leading this huge project, huge marathon. And uh, we are excited at ABN and the Trinity Channel. And thank you very much. Also, I want also to say thank you to Pastor Brian Holmes for helping us, helping ABN in writing the um, messages or the narrations or the, the uh, Bible stories to record in the discipleship programs production. What we have is, uh, is Brian is writing messages and then uh, that message is it's in English, obviously. What we do, we uh, translate it into, convert it into all other languages because we have a team of over 50 uh, leaders and uh, pastors international from Middle East, from Africa and, uh, and uh, the Far East. So we convert those to their languages and then they are producing those 10 minutes recording uh, short discipleship messages, and then we put them 
on their channels. So I am excited and I praise God for all four of you tonight. Thank you. If you have any question, uh, Pastor Bill or any one of the, your guest speakers, I am honored to talk to you. All right. Uh, let me ask the first question. You guys, if you have a question for uh, Dr. Bossom, uh, Dr. Bossom, uh, you grew up uh, in a, a country that is not necessarily known because of its strong Christian heritage, though there is a Christian heritage there. Uh, and you, as you tell your story, you came to Christ when you were working on a PhD in mechanical engineering in England. And it was a, another student of, from Nigeria that talked to you about Jesus and he himself was the new convert and you and your wife accepted Christ, got into a small Bible college and got some training and you had a heart to reach the Chaldeans, uh, you're, you being a Chaldean yourself. And you got into a radio ministry, if I understand correctly. Started what, in your garage? Correct, yes, in the garage at the beginning. And then we turned into a few local TV stations producing. Well, we had two um, um, weekly Bible translators. Um, they, they were supposed to be in other countries, but because of the danger, so they were assigned to me, to our, our ministry, because I was translating the Bible into Chaldean language. And they helped me to to um, like expand the ministry from Bible translation also into media. And they were helping me in their knowledge in computers and video editing, etc. And that was the, the first nuclei of ABN. At that time, it was ABT, Aramaic Bible translation. Then we developed it to um, ABN, Aramaic Broadcasting Network. By the way, can I just encourage you with one uh, uh, a simple uh, sentence? The guy that he introduced me to Jesus, and actually I was rebellious at the beginning. He was fighting with me and I didn't like him when we were in the basement of, uh, of that uh, university, Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, but he was persistent and he kept annoying me. And especially when every time when he wants to, to start, he says, we have to have a short prayer first. That was really, really too hard, too much for me. But uh, then later on, I say, thank you, Lord, for Banjo. And, uh, and now the, the, the fruit of Banjo, the Lord has re rewarded him and his country that I, we have ABN. Now we have five speakers out of 54. They are Nigerians, some in Europe, some here in North, in North, uh, one only, two, two in North uh, Carolina and the rest in Nigeria, uh, producing the discipleship programs in two languages, in Hausa and in Yoruba. So see how the Lord works? He brought me to Christ. Then after, since 98, or you counted, since 1990, let's say, until now, now the Lord is, has blessed their countries because of his fruit. If it wasn't Banju, this channel to Nigeria in two languages would have not been done. So that's how God yeah. works. Anyway. So it's, well, I, I am blessed and I am honored, though I don't deserve that, but the Lord uses the broken people. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, uh, Dr. Bassam, as you talked about Yoruba and Hausa languages, I probably knew as much about those two languages before the age of 10, simply because our missionaries went to Nigeria in 1906. Mm. And uh, that's that's where they were. My my, uh, my stepmother was uh, a missionary nurse in Nigeria, and amongst those people. So that's exciting uh, to hear about that, and now how they are there in uh, sharing the gospel. So, uh, Dr. Bossom, let me also ask you. I know that uh, 
you're developing this ministry to up to 15 different languages in some of the major languages of the world. And also all of the things that are necessary for mm. uh, getting this message out for all the servers that are required, all of the computers that are necessary, all the cameras and those types of things. How, how can people, how can they get involved financially? Let's, I just want to break it down to that. Somebody said, no money, no ministry. And that is true. And so I, I'm, I'm speaking to people who are, that God has, you. he's gifted you, he's, he's blessed you. You can participate in this ministry. You can help maybe buy a computer or a projector or a server. And, and so, you know, we, we're on two satellites tonight on Yasat and uh, also Nilesat, and they, they don't come cheap. And so uh, you can help. So what can they do, Dr. Bossom? How, how can they get in touch with you and share a ministry? Uh, you're muted for some reason, maybe when you went to the- uh, uh, it's, No, it's from, from the studio. Okay, you're on now, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for asking me this question. And it is true. Uh, I mean, without it, uh, without it resources, without it money, uh, especially a big network um, like this, uh, it's not only ABN and Trinity Channel. We do have another five or six channels, also 24-7 broadcasting to uh, Middle East and, and the Far East. And obviously, each one of it, it has speakers, it has technicians, it has programs and um, everything. So um, to support uh, this big project and this ministry, um, number one, obviously, um, we do need some income, number one, to cover the expenses, not just the two satellites, yes, um, like Nyasat, as a total, we pay something around ten thousand dollars per month, U.S. dollars. Um, the Yahsat, um, another nice total, something let's say about eight thousand, eight thousand and a half per month. But uh, uh, to run a satellite TV station with multi channels to different languages, uh, to be honest, it. It, it costs something about 70 to 80,000 minimum, okay? But uh, unfortunately, in the last two years, last year and this year, though the Lord has, has been blessing us and we are increasing, but the income is going down and down. Now, I don't, if you ask me, then how are you doing it? One, the th one of the things that we are doing it because you know how many we are. We are only like less than 10. And uh, we are working day and night. Uh, because, and that's my second request is, we are in desperate need for few volunteers to take some of the responsibilities. Actually, we, as you know, and I talked to you, Pastor Bell, we need even one um, like retired pastor or a man of God retired to take the responsibility and to uh, to to help us from his state or from his country and that that the title to be he will be um, uh, um, a project leader what project the discipleship the whole discipleship project of the 15 languages uh, we do need a lot of leaders, um, pastor, uh, I mean, uh, um, staff, volunteers, and um, in case um, there's, um, he, you cannot, I'm talking to viewers, in case if you do not have the time, the full time to do that, um, we, we admire, we accept even to give us a couple of days per, per uh, week. Uh, we have a lot of responsibilities, and uh, the 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 load on our shoulders, especially now. Because uh, oh, last thing I'll say, just give me a mo two more minutes. I'm gonna jump now to this 50 to 52 
machineries. They are really our machineries. We call them our machineries. They are in Turkey, in Iraq, in Egypt, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, um, India, and Bangladesh. So they are poor. They are living in the 1040 window. And uh, we cannot just use them and not help them. So that's another load now we are experiencing this year to support them as well. So we are crying for help. And uh, I ask uh, our viewers is please remember us in your prayer as we are going through this struggle. Maybe the Lord, he will open a few more doors in the coming months. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bassem. I and mean, you'll see a place there. Can we put that up? Email us at that address again. Uh, the technicians can put that up. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, yes. they can just email you at abn at abnsat.com. And so I trust that you'll do that. Well, uh, we are pretty much out of time for this particular show. We've been talking about building this culture of uh, biblical uh, character. And we're going to continue that. And we're going to get a little bit more specific about how we develop a discipleship strategy. We're going to be talking about that in the next hour. In 30 minutes, we, we'll start that next show. And our panel will be back with us. We have uh, uh, some different topics, some different questions. And so we invite you to come back and be a part in 30 minutes and also, uh, I would think if you have some questions that you might like to ask, you can uh, send those uh, to our technicians there at WhatsApp, and there's some uh, a phone number, and you can be a part of that. You could just send us those questions, and we would love to try to respond as best we can. But anyway, thank you for joining us. We'll be back in 30 minutes with another show. So we trust that you'll stay around. And why don't you call somebody? Tell them what, what app they can go to, just the abnsat.com. They can click on live and you can join us and be a part of and watch the show there. So we trust you'll be back. We'll be back in 30 minutes. I want to thank our panel again. And uh, gentlemen, we'll see you in about 30 minutes. God bless you. And thanks for joining us. Join us Wednesday, April 21st. For special programming, What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 1, premiering at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join us again at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for What Christian Leadership Is and Is Not, Part 2. Both shows will be hosted by Rev. Dr. Bill Hostler, with special guests Rev. Phil Whitmore, Rev. Ron Williams, and Rev. Sean Azaro.